So today I wanted to start with uh, something a little different. Um, last Friday, I had a chance to attend to Maricopa Community College System Student Success Conference. And you know that I'm a big believer in the fact that to be a good educator, I as well should be always learning. So one of the most meaningful parts, I would say, uh, of the conference, for me at least, was the session hosted by the district-wide Purpose Coalition. And especially hearing the students share their thoughts. Because really, you are the only reason why we are here. So this session discussed a lot about finding one's purpose. And I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about that. So one of the things that we discussed about that was what does it take for one to feel that they matter? And one of the things that gives a meaning to oneself is feeling that they are valued. But in addition, for many of us, we want to feel that we are adding value. So serving others, serving community, serving those around us, and making an impact to the world around us. And it is at the intersection of these two where the magic happens. way to look at this is to find a place and a way where one feels that they belong to. And we also want to have a purpose. And again, it is where these two overlap, where we feel that we belong and our purpose matches with that, where we ideally would like to be and find ourselves. At. So we spent a lot of time asking from each other, but also, and I think more importantly, hearing from the students that what is their purpose? What drives them to wake up in the morning? Why you come to our class, we know that you have so many things going on in your lives, and yet you make a choice to be here. We value that, and we want to understand your why. One of the things for me that was very big was that I realized that to be a good teacher to you, I should know what is your why. But probably even more importantly, I would say, you should know what is your why. And I want us to spend next few moments for you to take a little time to reflect on your purpose. And how are you accomplishing what steps are you taking towards it? Is you being here one of those steps? And you remember that earlier on this semester, we have been using these little gratitude jars where we collected all kinds of goals from personal goals to academic goals and self-care goals. We also did positive affirmations of others and ourselves, which was for many of us kind of harder. But now I think we should move one step further from just this jar and add our purpose to it. So I'll give a few moments for you to work on thinking, what is your purpose? And I would love if you're able to in your breakout groups to share that out. But remember that it's never share or die in these classes. Uh, you are free to share as much or as little as you feel comfortable. I 
when we do these activities, one of the things that I think that many of us end up saying is that one big purpose that we all share is the desire to help others. And I think that that's really unifying for many of us in the healthcare carriers. But I think that just as important it is to take that time to reflect, how are we accomplishing that purpose? If you are struggling to come up with your own purpose, here is an example of actually a mic. I want to inspire others and myself as well and take part in the world with enthusiasm and excitement. And if you found that this exercise is really difficult for you, uh, the good news is that it is completely okay. You do not need to have a crystal clear idea of your purpose. Not many people have that. But you can go out there and you can try new things and see if any of those experiences lights your fire. This is where our college's service learning and volunteering opportunities can come in handy. So I encourage you to try those if you are still looking for your purpose. So moving onwards to the actual lecture content of the day. Uh, I work very closely with our nursing department and I often ask from them that what is it that I can do more to help our students so that they are successful in their nursing careers after taking the prereq classes with me. One of the themes that they shared with me was having an understanding of concentrations in fluids in our bodies. So I felt that today is a perfect time and space for us to explore a little bit of that. So what we are doing today is discussing fluids and fluid balance, especially from the point of view of solutes in fluids. So we can find fluids in a few different compartments in our body. Uh, we can find fluids uh, within the vascular space. This is the fluid in the blood vessels, if you wish. Uh, we also find fluids in cellular space. This is, this is the fluid supporting the cell activities. And the third one really is uh, the third space or edema, if you think about it from a clinical point of view, the fluid in between the cells. And you might ask, why does this matter? I'll give you first a my personal why. And then we'll have a look of a why that's probably more of a broadly relevant to the nursing field. Example of why this matters from my own research career can be kind of seen on the next few slides. Here we see an MRI image of a heart. And remember that heart is located in this very weird kind of strange angle in our body and same goes for the pictures that we are acquiring of the hearts. Uh, so here we are seeing the left ventricle of the heart, right ventricle next to it. We're seeing the rib cage, we're seeing lungs, we're seeing diaphragm and liver underneath it. Typically when we take an MRI picture of a patient, and if we have a blockage in one of the coronary arteries, this is what we would see. So we do acquire these images by using a contrast and uh, we see this bright signal from the hard wall tissue. That is uh, a region that has been starved of oxygen and nutrients. So it has died. There is nothing we can do about that. That tissue is dead. But what our research team is especially interested in is these novel maps that we're seeing here. T1 and T2 maps of the heart with the MRI. And here we see an elevated signal 
from the tissue even before it is dead. So an area that is at risk to die, if flow to this area is not established again. So essentially we can predict with a very high accuracy the damage that happens if no intervention is made. So you can see how this would be super useful for clinical practice, but why does this happen? Well, MRI looks for hydrogen, so water, and when heart muscle tissue is at danger of di dying, something really interesting happens. About 48 hours before it dies, uh, irreversibly, the water that is normally inside the cells moves from the cell to this extracellular space, becoming extracellular fluid. And it is this fluid that we can detect with this particular technique with the MRI. So that is one example of why we need to understand where the fluids are in the body. And Another one, and I think that probably more important reason for nurses is that water tends to go in the body to areas where we find a lot of solutes. Remember the concept of tonicity that we discussed last time. So what are these solutes? Let's have a look at that. Well, they are things like our electrolytes, glucose, albumin, um, fats, proteins in our body, and many waste products. And what's important to notice is that water travels to areas where these are found in high concentrations. So as a reminder of the movement of the water, let's revisit the concept of tonicity. Uh, and normally, again, I would take a little bit of time to discuss this in groups, but I'm just simply going to spearhead ahead uh, and you can kind of reflect whether this agreed with what you remembered. So we had really three states that we were looking at, and we're going to start with hypotonic situation. Here inside the cell contains more of these uh, solutes uh, than, than what we saw. Uh, with the with the outside of the cell. And as a result, remember, water always tries to balance off that concentration di difference. As a result, water is now rushing into the cell and the cell ends up swelling. And it is possible that the cell could even burst. Uh, we saw an example of that when we discussed a case where someone died as a result of consuming too much just water within a very short period of time and not allowing themselves to urinate. So how I always remember hypotonic cells, these big swollen cells, because water is flowing inside to them, is to think of an animal that sounds fairly similar to hypotonic. I think of hippos. Hippos are in my mind these big swollen animals. So big swollen cells, hypotonic cells, hippo cells. The next tonicity, state that we had was isotonic cells. You remember in isotonic cells, we have the same amount of these solutes inside the cell as we have outside. So even though there's some water always entering to the cell and some leaving the cell, it, then there is no net gain or net loss of water. The cell remains the same size. So how I think of isotonic cells, they're almost like cells that say that isoperfect they don't need to change. If you're perfect, you do not need to change. So they remain the same size. And the final one was our hypertonic cells. You remember with hypertonic cells, the outside of the cell contained more solute. So as a result, water rushes out of the cell, trying to balance off this difference. And as water rushes out of the cell, cell ends up shrinking and it can even dry up. And how I remembered hypertonic cells, I was thinking of people who are hyper. What are those people who are hyper? They often have a lot of energy. And if you have a lot of energy, what happens? You run around and those people become very skinny. So they were our skinny cells, hypertonic cells. So these cells that were drying up. But let's take this concept a little bit 
out from this and think of it as a little differently. And this is really going to be the focus of our class today. So let's talk about Kool-Aid. And you do have your worksheet that you can follow me with along as we're working through that. And every now and then I will point out and you'll see at the upper right corner of the slide that there is a reference to a question in your worksheet. Uh, so this is your lab report and I'm referring for you to kind of tackle that question, answer to that question at that time. So that's the big idea and big plan behind this activity. And let's start with some of the very basic terms. I think that it's important that we have shared understanding of what we're talking about. And these three terms look very similar, but they are very, very different. And we want to understand that. We want to be clear of that. So let's start with solution. So solution is what you end up with at the end. Uh, it is usually homogeneous, so it looks the same throughout. Uh, it's often this transparent mixture, but it can have, or it can also not have a color. And I think that a good example of that is Kool-Aid. Uh, Kool-Aid has a color, yet it is fully homogeneous fluid that's transparent. So Kool-Aid is our final solution. So it contains the solute and solvent that we needed to create the solution. Solute instead is the substance or it could be also substances that are being dissolved. And note that there is a common misconception that they would always have to be solid. They can be solid, they can be liquid, they can be gas. And you could even have more than one solute. So think of, for example, I think a good example is dissolving both sugar and salt into water. And both of them will dissolve into that water. So both of them will be our solutes in this example. And the final one that we have to look at is going to be our solvent. This is what the solute dissolves into. And usually this is water, and that's why water is called universal solvent, because most things do actually end up dissolving in water. And always what we end up finding is that the majority component is the solvent. So that's what you have the most of when we're doing these solutions. So let's kind of refer to our worksheet and to our very first question on the worksheet and identify from this picture are three different important terms. So solution, solute and solvent. I'll give you just a few moments to take a moment to identify them yourselves before I move onwards and uh, say what I had on mind. And I think that most of you would have probably had a chance to think about what you would answer there. And let's start with solution. So solution is going to be this final Kool-Aid drink that you made. See, it's this clear. You can even see the ice cubes in it, but it does have that red color. So it does not have to be clear or colorless. Uh, it can just be clear and have a color in it. The next one that we're going to see is going to be our solute. Our solute is the Kool-Aid powder itself. In this case, it is a solid powder, but remember, it doesn't always have to be powder. It could be in other phases as well. And obviously, our solvent is going to be our water. Solvent is the majority component, and we have more water than anything else here. So if you got this right, I'm very, very impressed and very pleased. And you know that in my face-to-face -face classes, I'm always giving you a little reward. So uh, you're welcome to come to my office and pick up your duck for getting the answers right, if you caught that. And remember, we're collecting ducks. We're trying to get our ducks in a row on this class. <laughs> So let's keep moving onwards and upwards, and we're going to take the same concept, and now we're going to talk about molarity. 
And molarity tells us the concentration of solute in a solution. So it's going to be an important concept for us to consider. And I wonder, my question is for you, and you remember one of my goals personally was to turn to wonder when I'm confused about something. So now here I am wondering that what molarity is cool A? And there's really three types of people in this world. There are th three types of people in terms of Kool-Aid that they enjoy in this world, at least. There's those who enjoy it very weak, some that enjoy it kind of normal strength, and some that really enjoy it super strong. And in this exercise, we know that we want to produce 200 milliliters of Kool-Aid in each of these concentrations, each of these molarities. And we also have this formula for calculating the molarity. Note that the formula uses liters, but we're going to want to use milliliters. So we have to do some kind of a conversion here. And let's get that out of the way. And let's remember our conversions that 200 milliliters is the same as 0.2 liters. So that might be the first part of us finding a solution for this uh, problem that we're facing. And now let's do a formula to figure out how many moles. So our moles are going to be the X, the unknown. How many moles do we need to make each of these three types of Kool-Aids that we saw? So here we have the first formula, the second formula, we just plug in the molarity. Again, the amount, final amount that we're trying to get remains the same. And again, X remains the unknown and same for the last one. And what we can do if you think of back using the mathematics, which is always a good solution when we're dealing with these challenges, we can do cross multiplication here. And as we're doing this cross multiplication, we are ending up with a result that gives us the moles that are needed to produce each of these concentrations of Kool-Aid drink, and in particular to produce 200 milliliters of each of these concentrations of Kool-Aid drinks. So now we need to find out our molar mass of the Kool-Aid. And how can we do that is going to be the question. And you remember, I've given you our periodic table of elements, but one thing that you'll notice real quickly is that there is no such element as Kool-Aid. Well, if we go to the label of the Kool-Aid, we'll see that the first ingredient that we'll end up seeing there, uh, that's gonna be giving us a clue of what we are actually uh, looking for. And the first ingredient in the Kool-Aid bottle that we'll see is going to be sucrose. So C12H22O11, and we can find all of those in our periodic table of elements, and we can calculate their molar mass. So collectively, the molar mass of sucrose, when we do our math, ends up being about 342 grams per mole. Uh, obviously, this is not totally accurate number, but it is really close to the Kool-Aid. So we can go with that 342 grams per mole number. And now we just plug in the molar mass of Kool-Aid. So sucrose's molar mass on our formulas that we have here. And one of the things that we can do, we can actually remove the same units from this uh, equation. And doing the math gives us actually how many grams of Kool-Aid do we need to make 200 milliliters of each of these concentrations of our Kool-Aid drink. So three different kinds of Kool-Aid drinks and three different concentrations. So we need three different amounts of the Kool-Aid powder to do it.
And next, what we will do, or what we would do in our face-to-face -face setting is that we would prepare these actual drinks. So you measure the correct amount, the weight of Kool-Aid, and we did the math earlier on, and you also have it on your worksheet if you were filling it as we were working through. And um, once we have the correct weight at the beaker, we add a little bit of water, so solvent to that beaker or to that jar, and uh, then we mix it, make sure that it dissolves there, and then we add the, um, the water until we actually get, uh, get the uh, correct amount, 200 mils of each of these, and it should all dissolve really nicely. And what we end up with is three different types of Kool-Aid drinks. So let's have a look of those. Uh, what kind of drinks are we left with? We're left with this really weak Kool-Aid drink uh, that we can see. And um, I'm asking you as one of your questions in the worksheet to describe uh, what would it taste? And obviously, since we are in a lab setting, we're not going to be tasting, but you can speculate what it would taste. And we end up finding that this weakest Kool-Aid, we can tell that it's Kool-Aid because it is a little bit of red, but it's not super strong. Um, and there's very little flavor to it. It's, it's really bland. Uh, it's very dilute. And the second Kool-Aid, the one that's 0.4 molar. Um, this is probably the one that most people would like, so it tastes like a normal Kool-Aid, if you wish. And the very final one, the 0.7 molar one, that's a really concentrated Kool-Aid. Uh, for most of us, way too sweet to enjoy. So now let's do a little detour, since we've seen that we prepared three different kinds of Kool-Aids. Their concentrations of the powder varied from 0.1 molar to 0.4 and 0.7 molar. And that had an effect on the flavor that we had. And we had that very weak uh, that makes no one happy. That's really good if you have kids, you want to save money and you don't want to give kids too much sugar, but they still get the experience. Uh, the one that we normally would drink and then the super sweet one that might be a lot to process for most of us. But let's do a little tour, tour detour from this story and do a little bit of cultural awareness. So in my background in Scandinavia, we believe in trolls. And some of the trolls that exist, they are good and then you have some naughty trolls that we have as well that are not as good. And now we're going to do an imaginary exercise thinking of our Kool-Aids. Imagine that your home has been visited by what we call in my language a tooth troll. This type of troll wants your teeth to develop cavities, so they're kind of naughty trolls. Uh, I think one of the American expressions that I've seen is that these sometimes get called cavity creeps. And if you've ever wondered what this two troll would look like, here's an illustration by one of the artists, what you could expect a two troll to look like. So this true two troll has a goal of ruining your teeth, causing you to have cavities. And this two troll to accomplish this out of these three drinks that we just prepared, they came and they threw away the drinks that were 0.1 molar and 0.4 molar Kool-Aids. And only Kool-Aid drink that you have left is this super strong, super sugary, and probably super cavity causing one as well, this pre-mixed 0.7 molar Kool-Aid. But you desperately want to drink some Kool-Aid without totally damaging your teeth. So what could you do? Only thing that we have is this super sugary, super strong teeth ruining Kool-Aid. What can we do to deal with this? Well, we need to find a way to go from 0.7 molar Kool-Aid drink and make it to that 0.4 molar. But remember that fairy threw, threw away or just trolled through away 0.4 molar drink, so we have nothing else to work from than this original super strong 
pool, right? And we want to be very exact. We can't just start pouring water at random and hope that it ends up being this 0.4 molar. We actually have to be more accurate. So the question becomes, how do we convert this 0.7 molar Kool-Aid that we have uh, into 0.4 molar Kool-Aid? And the answer is that we must dilute this 0.7 molar into 0.4 four molar. And we could, like I said, just add water and hope for the best, but we want to be exact. And when we want to be exact, one of the things that we often end up doing is that we end up doing some math. And we're going to use a formula that looks at the molarity and the volume both before the dilution and molarity and volume after the dilution. So we're seeing this formula can be simplified as we're seeing here. So we have before values and these before values in our case were the strong Kool-Aid, 0.7 molar Kool-Aid. And the after values that we're seeing was that kind of a normal weakness <laughs> of a Kool-Aid. Not the totally bland, but the one that we're used. So we have before values and after values both for molarity and volume on both cases. So let's plug in some numbers. So we know that the starting molarity is going to be 0.7 moles since we have that drink, the strong stuff. And we know that the end molarity that we're after is going to be 0.4 molar, the kind of weaker stuff, the one that we're used to that most people drink. But we do not know what to put for the volume ones, what are the volumes that we're working with if we're using this formula to solve it? So that's going to be our first step to figure that out. So the before volume, uh, let's think of that we did that drink. We did that 200 milliliters of it, but because I wanted to find out, is it really so sugary? I actually tasted a little bit of it, uh, not in real life, but in, in our imaginary scenario. So this super strong Kool-Aid drink, and I did not like it, it was way too sugary. So let's say that I consumed about five milliliters of it. So that gives us a clue of the amount of the initial Kool-Aid that we have left. So if I take five milliliters away from 200 milliliters, I'm left with 0.195 liters of that starting drink. And the question mark, the X that we're trying to solve, is how many liters of the final Kool-Aid we end up with if we want to make it 0.4 molar. So this is something that we can totally do with math. And now that we have plugged in all of the needed values, we can solve this equation. And what we get is volume of 0.34 liters. But I guess that the question that we still have to answer is that what does this mean? Well, it means that I should keep adding water until the total volume of this solution reaches 0.34 liters. Then I have diluted it to 0.4 moles, which was the concentration that we wanted. So we're going to add water until we end up with the water level of 0.34 liters. And as I'm adding the water, you'll notice that it's becoming more and more dilute. So it's getting back to that, what we found as a comfortable, kind of nice tasting Kool Aid. And this is going to be very exact. This is not just a guesswork. This time we've actually worked with math and we can be certain that this new Kool-Aid that we just produced is going to be the same concentration as that Kool-Aid that we liked, but that the not the uh, troll threw away. So just by applying these concepts of maths, we've gotten where we want it to be. So now you could do this. You were in my face to face class, you could do all these steps. You would add the water to your 0.7 molar Kool Aid until you reach 0.34 liters. You would mix it, and this new Kool Aid that we have here would have the molarity of 0.4 moles. And then, if you compared it, 
to your original 0.4 molar drink. The question would be, what would your new Kool-Aid that you diluted uh, to be 0.4 moles look when you compare it to the original 0.4 molar drink? So that would be the question, and that would be again a question that you would end up finding in your lab worksheet. And what we end up finding is that it would taste exactly the same. Obviously, we're not going to taste things since we are in a lab setting. So I guess that the question that students would have at this point is that, well, why did we do all of this? How does this relate to nursing? What do we learn from this process? Well, what we learn from this process is that the amount of Kool-Aid was not actually changing as we were diluting the stronger molar, 0.7 molar Kool-Aid to be equal of the 0.4 molar Kool-Aid. Uh, it was actually the amount of water that was changing, not the amount of Kool-Aid. So I hope that that would make sense for you. So uh, I guess that how that then connects to the clinical practice is that when we are treating patients, before we start to deal with either adding or removing electrolytes, we always want to have our focus on how do we deal with the uh, with the with the uh, patients, whether they're hypo or hypervolemic. That's going to be our first priority, and only once we've addressed that we start looking whether we need to remove or replace electrolytes. And this is actually very much what uh, we're doing when we're doing fluid therapy. We need to be very clear of what kind of changes we're wanting to promote in the body. And based on that, we're choosing the proper IV fluids that we're using. And that's going to bring us to the end of this fluid balance talk that we had together. I hope you found it useful and interesting. I think that, at least for me, it's a really good illustration of this concept and why it is so, so, so important for us to actually pay attention to the patient and pay attention to that let's not tackle those electrolytes those solvents until we've tackled the issues that come with the uh, with the proper hydration of the patient. So I'm going to wrap it up here today. I thank you for joining me and I hope you have a very good week. It was certainly my pleasure to catch up with you today. Thank you. Until next time. Bye.